I approached the counter and asked the clerk if there were any messages for me. He checked the box for room 305, took out a slip of paper, and handed it to me. As I was reading it, two men who had been sitting in the lobby got up and headed for me. The note simply asked me to call Detective Howard Miller and gave me a phone number. The two men walked up, one on either side of me, and the one on my right asked if I was Frank Thomas. I said yes. He flashed a badge and said, I'm Detective Larson, and the gentleman to your left is Detective Phillips. I asked, what can I do for you? Larson asked, is that note in your hand from Detective Miller of the Branson Police Department? I replied, it is from a Detective Miller, but I have no idea where he is from. Apparently, he called and left that message a little after nine o'clock this morning. When I never returned his call, he called you and asked if you would find me. May I ask where you have been all day? I answered, from eight o'clock until around nine o'clock, I had breakfast here in the hotel restaurant with a couple of acquaintances. From nine o'clock until noon, I attended a seminar in one of the hotel's meeting rooms. Noon to one was lunch with some folks I met during the seminar, and from one o'clock to four-thirty, I attended the afternoon session. From four-thirty to six was the cocktail hour following the seminar. Six to seven-fifteen, or thereabouts, was dinner in the hotel restaurant, and from seven-fifteen until five minutes ago, it was drinks in the boom-boom room. Now, what is this all about? Larson said, I think it would be best if you talk to Detective Miller about that. One last question. Where were you last night between the hours of midnight and four o'clock? I replied, in bed sleeping. He asked, anyone who can confirm that? I said, why would I need someone to confirm that I was sleeping? You need to get that from Detective Miller. I looked from Larson to Phillips and then walked over to the house phone. I told the operator to build a call to my room, and then placed a call to the number on the note to Detective Miller. Apparently, it was a cell phone because, despite the late hour, it was answered on the third ring. Hello, Detective Miller. Yes, my name is Frank Thomas, and I have a message to call you. Oh yes, Mr. Thomas, you are a hard man to get in touch with. I explained, I have been in meetings most of the day. I didn't get your message until just now. I have two policemen from the local force with me right now, and they are asking me questions, but they won't tell me what it is all about. I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, Mr. Thomas, but your wife is dead. What? How? She was all right when I talked to her last night. What time was that? Around six. Where did you call her from? My hotel room. Sometime between midnight and four o'clock this morning, she was murdered. Murdered? Oh my God. Any idea who did it? Was it a robbery gone bad? Anything stolen? Like the TVs, jewelry, or things like that? I can't talk about it on the phone, Mr. Thomas. We will go over the details when you get home. I'll try and be on the first flight in the morning. Could I please speak to the officers with you? Of course. I handed the phone to Larson. I'll be up in my room packing. I need to call the airlines and leave some messages for the people giving the seminar. On the flight home, I thought about Melissa. We'd met at a cocktail party, and I had fallen head over heels in love with her, a fiery redhead with a face that lit up a room when she smiled in a body that was built for sin. She was with someone. And since the party was attended by quite a few people that I wanted to do business with, I had to play it cool. I waited until I caught her alone, and when I didn't think anyone was looking, I handed her a piece of paper with my name and phone number on it and a short message. Call me. She called me the next day and asked why I had presumed that she would call. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, I said. And a British military unit has a motto that fits this situation. Who dares, wins. How can I pass up a chance at meeting someone so confident? You really shouldn't. She gave me her address, and I picked her up at six that evening for dinner. She had the whole package, looks, wit, charm, and intelligence. 
On our third date, she told me that we would be eating in, and I just needed to bring the wine. When dinner was over and the bottle of wine was empty, she took my hand and said, I hope you hadn't planned on leaving early. We need to see if we have a future together. She led me into her bedroom and proceeded to sleep with me. The woman was insatiable, but I must have done all right because in the morning, after another strenuous rum, she said, You will do. Nine months later, we were married. My thoughts were interrupted by the Please put your seat backs and tray tables in their upright position announcement as we prepared for landing. I had called ahead to let Miller know what flight I'd be on and when it was due. He and his partner, Detective Paulson, were waiting for me when I came off the plane. After the introductions, he asked me to accompany them to the station. I told him I'd get my car out of the parking garage and either follow them or meet them at the station. He said that they would really rather I go with them. I responded, I would really rather not. I'm here, my car is here, and there is no sense in my going all the way downtown with you and then having to turn around and come all the way back out here to get my car. So unless you are arresting me, I'm going to get my car. One might wonder why you aren't being very cooperative, Mr. Thomas. No one in my situation would wonder. How about we shorten the dance a bit? My wife has been murdered, and we both know that I am a suspect even though I was almost 400 miles away. We both know that you have the officers you talked with last night checking out everything that I told them before I called you. We both know that you wouldn't tell me anything about what happened to my wife when we talked last night. All you said was that we would talk about it when I got back here. Now you want me to just walk off and leave my car here. That tells me that you don't think I'm going to need it anymore, which tells me that you have pretty much decided that I'm your guy and you expect to see me behind bars before the day is over so my car can just sit and you expect me to cooperate. Cooperation is a two-way street, detective. He looked at me and then nodded his head. I guess we are getting off on the wrong foot here. He looked around and then pointed at one of the many food places scattered throughout the terminal and said, let's get a table and some coffee and I'll bring you up to speed. Once we were sitting with coffee, Miller said, at approximately 9.10 yesterday morning, a friend of your wife's, Mary Osborne, arrived to pick your wife up for a prearranged shopping date. When no one answered the bell, she tried the door and found it open. She called for your wife and got no answer. She checked and saw that your wife's car was still in the garage. So, thinking that your wife might have overslept, she went upstairs and found your wife dead on the bedroom floor. She called 911, but according to the coroner, your wife had been dead for at least four hours when her friend found her. You said that she had been murdered. She had been shot twice. Why do I have the feeling that you aren't telling me everything? Because I'm not. There is a procedure that has to be followed in cases like this. There needs to be a formal interrogation at the station, which will be recorded. I've already told you more than I'm supposed to. Go get your car and meet us at the station. Should I have an attorney with me? That is up to you. You certainly have the right. As a policeman, I have to admit that I don't want you to exercise that right. Attorneys have a habit of constantly interrupting, and it impedes the flow of the interrogation. And a smooth-flowing interrogation in itself can tell the interrogator something. So, I'm going to be interrogated. Of course you are. You said it yourself. Until you are cleared, you are a person of interest as far as the investigation into your wife's death is concerned. We finished our coffee and I took the shuttle to pick up my car. At the station, I was ushered into a room, and Miller and Paulson joined me. They warned me that the session was being recorded and asked if I wanted an attorney present. I told them no. I was asked my whereabouts on the night in question, and I told them the same things I told the detectives at the hotel. Then Paulson asked me, Do you own a handgun? Several. Oh, any twenty-two calibers? No. Mostly Colt 45s and Glock 40s mostly. I may have a couple of 357 Magnums, but I'm not sure. How can you own them and not be sure? I don't actually own them, 
my company does. Your company. Paladin Security Services. You own Paladin. Yes, I do. He pondered that for a couple of seconds and then asked, Do you know Robert Turner? I've never met him, but I know who he is. What do you know about him? Well, I'm not really up to date on this, but as of last week, he was my wife's current lover. You know that. Yes, I think it was around the beginning of April that she took up with him. Maybe you should get an attorney, Mr. Thomas. Why? Because you have just admitted knowing that Robert Turner is your wife's lover and Robert Turner was found dead in the bedroom with your wife. And you have just assumed that I, being the outraged husband, killed them both in a fit of jealous rage. That's absurd. If I was going to kill anyone in a fit of rage, it would have been Ronald Porter. He was the first one she cheated on me with. Since Porter, there have been at least four others. And I've never harmed a hair on any of their heads. You know all of this for a fact. I have the private detective's reports on them. And you did nothing. I could see the look on Paulson's face. It read, You sorry, wimpy bastard. What kind of a man are you? I thought, Forget you. To myself, and answered Miller, You ever been through a divorce, or know someone who has? I've not, but I know several who have been. How did the man come out on the deal? Not well, I'm afraid. That was my problem. I've done well for myself. My home is worth a little over $3 million, and the business I've worked my butt off to build is worth around $10 to $12 million. This is a no-fault state, so even catching Melissa cheating, she would get half of everything. I would have to sell a house and business, give half to Melissa, and then end up paying court costs and attorney's fees, and probably end up paying her alimony for a year. Still, it is motive. Maybe, but it wouldn't make sense for me to kill her, and chance going to jail when I would be rid of her, for free in another nine months. How is that? She would have come into a trust fund when she reached thirty, which is only nine months away. It is somewhere in the neighborhood of seven million. We would have had equal assets then, and I could divorce her and keep all I've got. In fact, her getting herself killed now robs me of a windfall. If she had waited until she was thirty to get wasted, I would have inherited. As it is now, all that money will go to a bunch of charities. It would have been worth my while to have lived with her for nine more months. You never did tell me. How did she die? Two shots to the forehead. Turner got it the same way. Two in the forehead. A double tap to the head. Ring any bells. Should it? Have you checked out Turner's wife? She has a rock-solid alibi. No surprise there. She would have. Have you checked out her family? Her family. Her father is Vito Genovese, and if even half of what you hear about him is true, he would have no problem finding someone to help him out with a problem brought to him by his darling daughter. Family honor and all that nonsense, isn't it? Double tap to the head, the sign of a mob-style hit. Miller and Paulson looked at each other, and I could see the wheels turning. Miller looked at me and asked, Can you back up what you were saying? I've got the P.I. reports on our lovers, and I can give you the name of her attorney, and I would imagine you can get the trust fund information from him. The part about Genevieve's is in the P.I. report I got on Turner. Did your wife know that you were aware of her activities? I don't think so. I acted like a clueless husband around her. She was darn good in bed, and she never said no to me, and I wasn't about to go without sex until she turned thirty and I wasn't going to play outside the marriage and give her a chance at catching me and divorcing me. I don't think we have any more to ask at this time, but please keep us informed as to your whereabouts in case we need to talk with you again. As they lowered Melissa's casket into the hole, I looked around at the assembled mourners and wondered if any one of them even had the slightest clue as to what happened. When I finished college at twenty, I wasn't ready to settle down. I wanted to do something exciting, take some chances, and enjoy life before settling into a nine-to-five life spent with a June Cleaver-type wife, 
house with the picket fence, and the 2.3 kids. Clinton was sending troops to Bosnia, and there ought to be some excitement there, so I joined the army. I didn't even make it through basic training. My third week in basic, several of the clowns in my platoon decided that they needed to teach the college boy some manners, and they threw me a blanket party. I was in the shower when it happened, with the blanket over me and several guys holding me. I should have been helpless as they started to beat on me with socks filled with soap bars. I'd never had any martial arts training and I don't even know why I did what I did. It was probably something I saw in a movie and subconsciously remembered. I swept my leg, not kicked, but swept hard from right to left, and knocked the legs out from under one of the guys. He fell, and his head hit the shower floor. And one of the others said, Christ, he's bleeding. One of the guys let loose of me to bend over and check on the guy on the floor. That loosened the grip on me. And another leg sweep took out another guy who fell to the floor. Suddenly, there weren't enough guys holding me and I jerked away from the ones who were and got out from under the blanket. Two men were down on the floor, a third was bent down over them, and the two who were standing were looking at me with looks that said, Whoa, this ain't the way it is supposed to happen. I grabbed one by the arm and swung him face first into the shower wall, and he went down. The other guy started to back away while the guy kneeling started to get up, figuring that I'd rather have him down than up. I kneed him in the face and saw blood spurt from his broken nose. As he started to fall, I kicked him hard in the ribs with the heel of my foot. I started for the guy still standing, and he turned and ran. The first guy I'd swept the legs out from under wasn't moving, but the second one was, and so I dropped on his back, grabbed his head, and smashed it into the floor. By then the platoon NCOs were there. Sergeant Mark saw the blanket and the soap-filled socks, and figured out right away what was going on. I tried to get by him, and he asked me where I thought I was going. There is one more, the bastards, and I'm going to get him. No, you aren't. I tried to get by him, and he said, Stop it, Thomas. I don't know how you managed them, but it won't be as easy with me. Now just stand over there while I sort it all out. It got sorted out, and I found myself in the post stockade. My second day there, I was called into a room where a captain was sitting behind a table. On the way from my cell to the room, the MP escorting me told me that I was to walk in, stop six feet in front of the table, salute, and say, Private Thomas reporting as ordered, and hold the salute until it was returned. I stopped in front of the table and said, I'm Private Thomas. Aren't you forgetting something? I don't think so. That should be, I don't think so, sir. And what you forgot was the salute. I didn't forget the salute or the sir. Both are a sign of respect, and I don't have any respect for people who are treating me the way I am being treated just because I defended myself. You put four men in the infirmary. Doesn't that bother you at all? The only thing that bothers me about it is that Sergeant Marks kept me from making it five. What is it going to take for you to start saying, Sir, you doing something to earn my respect? That started my long association with Lieutenant slash Captain slash Major slash Colonel Jones slash Smith, or whatever his real name and rank or apparent rank might be. My take no prisoners attitude was something that a certain section of the United States Army was interested in. I was pulled out of basic and shipped to an undisclosed location and given training that very few other recruits got. I learned how to use guns, knives, sticks, and stones. I learned how to pick locks, hot wire cars, create false identities, fly small airplanes, pilot small boats, and a whole host of other things. And then I was turned loose. The oath I took when I enlisted was to defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic, but the foreign part never entered into it. You would be amazed at how many domestic enemies America has, and our way of defending against them was to eliminate them. Accidental drowning, falls downstairs, and breaking necks. Auto accidents were just a few of the ways the problems were handled. Doing that kind of work tends to make you paranoid. 
you start asking yourself what would happen to you if an operation went bad. What if they needed a scapegoat? What if something happened and the best solution was for you to be disappeared or for your body to be found with incriminating documents or something of the like? Given what they had you doing, you just knew that if your elimination was needed, they wouldn't even hesitate. In the six years I spent with the group, I stashed money, weapons, and IDs in half a dozen locations. If the shit ever hit the fan, and I needed to bail out, I had several bolt holes. I never needed them, but I had them. When I took my discharge, I set myself up in the security business. In short, my company furnished security specialists, which is shorthand for bodyguards and armed guards for various companies. I'd been out a year when I met Melissa at a cocktail party, dated her, and then asked her to marry me. We had what I thought was a good marriage. We'd been married just a little over a year when I woke up one morning, looked down at Melissa sleeping beside me, and knew without a doubt that she was cheating on me. I never saw or heard anything to make me think that. I just woke up one morning, looked at her, and knew. Of course, that wasn't enough to confront her with, so I hired a private detective, and one week later, I had the goods on Melissa and one Ronald Porter. With that information in my hand, I had to decide what to do. Actually, I knew what to do. The trick was going to be doing it, and getting away with it. At home, Melissa was loving and affectionate, and she never denied me in the bedroom. In fact, at least half the time, Melissa was the instigator. I had no idea why she was cheating, but I didn't care to know either. All I knew was that the marriage would continue while I made plans. I periodically checked on Melissa over the next several years, and she had at least four more lovers. It could have been more, but if so, they took place during periods when I wasn't checking on her. I would sit on that information until the time was right. While I was in the army, I had learned to fly, but it was because of operational requirements, and I never developed a passion or even a liking for it. It was simply something that I occasionally had to do as part of an operation. Once out of the service, I never expected to fly again except as a passenger on a commercial airline using one of the false identities that I had stashed when I was in the service and some of the money I had squirreled away. I bought a Cessna 172, a Honda Accord, and a Harley. From one of my weapons stashes, I picked a silenced 22 caliber target pistol, and then I waited for the right opportunity. It came when I got the PI's report on Robert Turner and who his father-in-law was, I was always being invited to seminars and trade shows, and when I was invited to a seminar on industrial security, I accepted. At the end of Monday's program, I stayed around for one drink and then headed back to my room. I called Melissa and let her know where I was staying, told her I loved her and missed her, and she told me the same. I had chosen my hotel because it was one of the few in the area that did not have security cameras covering the halls and stairwells. Once in my room, I changed into jeans, tennis shoes, sweatshirt, and windbreaker. I put on a ball cap, a fake mustache, and a pair of glasses with clear lenses. I went down a stairwell and out a side door, then walked six blocks away and two blocks over, and flagged down a cab. It took me across town and dropped me at a bar. Once the cab was out of sight, I walked two blocks to a motel where I had prepositioned the Honda Accord. I drove out to the airfield where I had the Cessna parked, filed a flight plan for Athens, and then took off. Once in the air, I closed out my flight plan and headed for home. The flight was just a little over three hours, and after I had landed and tied down the Cessna, I got on the prepositioned Harley and headed for my house. I parked two blocks away, walked home, and quietly let myself into the house. I moved to my home office and got the bag that was in the closet and opened it. I took out a pair of latex gloves and a pair of booties and put them on. I took the taser out of the bag and double-checked that it held a full charge, always ready. So I quietly moved up the stairs toward the bedrooms and found that I had received a bonus. I was only expecting Melissa to be there, but from the sounds that were coming from the room, I could tell that she wasn't alone. 
As I moved quietly down the hall, I heard my wife asking for it harder, faster, and pleading with her partner to make her come. I stepped into the bedroom and immediately recognized the man with my wife as her latest lover, which was frosting on the cake for me. Melissa saw me, her face turned pale, and she screamed. Turner turned and saw me, and pulled out of Melissa just as I fired the taser at him. He fell to the floor and flopped around while I stepped quickly to the bed, grabbed Melissa, and shoved a ball gag into her mouth. I cuffed her to the bed and then, using the butt of the pistol, I smacked Turner in the head and knocked him out. I went back downstairs and got a sharp knife out of the knife block on the kitchen counter and went back upstairs. I smiled at Melissa and said, Nice of you to have your friend over. I expected to find you here alone. Silly me. I rolled Turner over onto his back and waited for him to come around. As I waited, I talked to Melissa. Have you been having a good time, wife? Is Turner better than Porter? Why did you dump Porter? Was it because Hathaway was better? But then, if it was always because you were looking for better, it would follow that Prince was better than Hathaway, Davidson was better than Prince. Dan, girl, that sure doesn't say much for me, does it? Melissa was crying and trying to pull loose from the bed as I talked, and finally Turner started to stir. I looked at Melissa and said, If Turner is so much better than the rest, it must be because you really like his cock, and who am I to deprive you of what you want? I reached down and took Turner's cock in my left hand and looked him right in the eye as I said, It isn't nice to be with another man's wife, especially in his house and on his bed. And then I cut his cock off and held it in front of Melissa's face while Turner screamed and kicked and flailed about on the bedroom floor. Here it is, Melissa, yours to have and hold forever. I pulled the ball gag out of her mouth and before she could close it, I stuffed Turner's cock as deep into her mouth as I could and then put the ball gag back in place so she couldn't spit it out. I picked up the silenced pistol and pointed it at Turner's forehead and said, I hope she was worth it, friend. And I put two rounds into him. I turned to Melissa and asked her, I guess I'll never know why you stabbed me in the back with all of those people over the years because I'm not going to take what is in your mouth out so you can speak. I just hope that all the good times you had were worth the price you are going to have to pay. It really is a shame, Melissa. I did love you. I pointed the pistol at her forehead and her eyes got really big before I pulled the trigger and closed them forever. I removed the ball gag, took the cuffs off her, and then picked up my brass. I put everything in the bag and left the house. Four hours later, I was back in my hotel room and the clock on the bedside table said 5.15. I caught two hours of sleep, then got up, had breakfast, and attended the seminar. I watched the casket as it was lowered into the ground and went back over everything in my head. I was pretty sure that I had everything covered. A check of my army service record would show that I spent all my time in the quartermasters working at supply depots, nothing there to trigger any interest. My lack of an alibi should serve as an alibi of sorts, since if I had done the dirty deed, I would have been expected to make sure that I had myself covered. I'd wait a couple of weeks and then arrange a business trip, and while I was on it, I would use my fake ID to sell the Cessna and the Accord. The Harley I left where it had a good chance of being stolen, and in any event, it couldn't be traced back to me. As I stepped forward and dropped a single red rose on Melissa's casket, I thought that all I had to do now was act normal and wait and see. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.